Hello, I'm Pavan Daliwal, and I'm the Head of Public Affairs at the British Humanist Association and the Vice Chair of the European Humanist Federation. And I would like to join in welcoming you all to the UK and to Oxford. And I hope that you're all as excited about Congress as we are. Now, we've just heard from John Stuart Mill, a great British humanist philosopher of more than a century ago. And we're lucky in the humanist movement that our crop of great thinkers never fails down the ages. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce one of the proofs of that fact as our first Congress plenary speaker. Now, AC Grayling will be known to you all. A vice president of the British Humanist Association, representative of IHU to the United Nations, and patron of the Defence Humanists. He is a world-renowned humanist philosopher. His most recent books are The God Argument, The Case Against Religion and For Humanism, and Friendship. But of course, all of his many books are relevant to us all. In addition, he sits on ed the editorial boards of several academic journals, and for nearly 10 years was the honorary secretary of the, British, of the principal British Philosophical, o Philosophical Association, the, I've, have, I've been having trouble pronouncing this, so I'm gonna go for it. Aristotelian. Aristotelian Society. <laughs> I've got it, I've got it. He's a past chairman of, the, of June 4th, the Human Rights Group Concerned with China, was a fellow of the World Economic Forum for several years, and a member of the C100 Group on Relations between the West and the Islamic World. Anthony today will be speaking to us about freedom of speech and freedom of such. After um, Anthony's given his talk, there'll be time for questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Anthony Grayling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, as uh, Pavel mentioned, I do have the honour to be a, a vice president of the British Humanist Association, and my principal role there is to provide a, a counterpoise uh, to Jim in the coiffure department. This is just to uh, <laughs> prove the fact that the BHA likes to touch all bases. Uh, the, the theme of this Congress could not be more central uh, and important to the worldwide humanist movement. Freedom of expression is the principal instrument by which people of a humanist and secular outlook can uh, defend their outlook, and heaven knows in many parts of the world, and many of the delegates here can testify to this from personal experience, the humanist and secular uh, worldview is very much under pressure. There are people in this room who have been persecuted, who have been treated brutally as a result of the fact that they live in places and in circumstances where uh, their views are very much in the minority and invite a great deal of hostility. This ranges from places in Africa where humanists struggle against the belief in witchcraft and the tremendously uh, um, horrible consequences of that belief, uh, all the way to the US where uh, to proclaim yourself as a, a person of secular or atheist outlook and carry very considerable social and employment disadvantages. So those of us who live in the UK or, or in Europe where it is practically costless to be a humanist, or an atheist, a secularist, um, we should be very well aware of the fact that many of our fellows uh, do not have the same liberty to take a stand on their beliefs and to speak out as, uh, as we do on all the variety of matters that are uh, of importance to us as humanists. And I would like to take this opportunity to say to those of our fellows from those countries how much we admire the work that they do and the stand that they take. And I would like to ask you to join me. Now, because, because freedom of expression is uh, vital, both to the defense of the humanist and secular outlook and the principal instrument by which we can carry our case uh, in all the different spheres where we need to argue against the uh, oppression, really, of certain types of worldviews, the loss of opportunity for half of humanity in, in many countries around the world, of women who live in uh, uh, religious dispensations which uh, 
uh, place very, very strict limitations on their participation in social life and the access they have to social goods. Uh, this is something we need to be very clear about, and we need to have very firm ideas about what we mean by freedom of expression. You notice I'm using the phrase freedom of expression rather than freedom of speech, which is, of course, the more, the more common one. But freedom of expression covers not only freedom of speech, but also artworks, performance works, even musical works sometimes, folk songs, which are critical of a, a current dispensation. So we need this much broader category because we need it to be the case that all the different ways in which human beings can put forward their point of view and can react to things should be protected by this absolutely fundamental right. And when I say absolutely fundamental right, I'm not being hyperbolic. Because without freedom of expression, no other rights and civil liberties are available to us. You cannot have, for example, a rule of law in which people uh, are, um, uh, have access to a, a fair trial where they can uh, accuse if they have been wronged or defend themselves if they have been accused. You cannot have such a process. You cannot have a democratic order unless people are able to put forward ideas and policies and other people can criticize them and test them. You cannot have education worth the name unless people are able freely to put forward uh, ideas, to explore, to inquire, to test, uh, to be skeptical, to challenge and discuss. You cannot have uh, an artistic and cultural life unless there is genuine freedom for writers, for artists, for performers, uh, for, for makers of art. To offer their fellows in society perspectives on that society and to, and wherever necessary and whenever possible to challenge those things in society with which they disagree. So you can see that from the point of view of the whole repertoire of rights and civil liberties that we hope uh, any civilized and mature society would live by, freedom of expression is fundamental to them. You cannot have any of those things unless people are able to, to speak and to write without prior constraint. But it is also obvious that freedom of expression is not an unqualified right. Everybody knows the standard example, you can't sh shout fire in a crowded cinema, especially when there's no fire there, because of the harm that it might cause. And so it becomes a matter of uh, real importance to discuss when it might be justified to place any kind of limits on freedom of expression. It's a very straightforward and obvious cases. In a time of war, for example, in the Second World War, it was mentioned that in the First World War the same thing happened, but with some uh, rather bad consequences. Again, in the Second World War, freedom of expression was limited and constraints were placed on the press. Uh, and this was because there was a, a, a great present danger and it was important that people shouldn't allow information um, uh, to be disseminated that could be of use to an enemy. But in those cases, uh, we noticed that the limitations on freedom of expression were temporary. There was no question then that they would survive much longer than the war itself. And uh, a good case, a good justification could be made for them. And that gives us our first indication of when it might be that we would accept limitations on freedom of expression. When there is a good, clear, highly specific case which is limited in its extent and in the time in which it applies. So what kinds of circumstances would that well-justified limitation uh, be um, acceptable? Well, one thing that we might do is to look, for example, at the discussions that the United States Supreme Court have had about the First Amendment right to freedom of expression, because that is one place where there has been reasonably careful discussion about uh, when the First Amendment right to uh, free speech could be curtailed. And they've come up with four circumstances where um, this might be justified. The obvious one is advocacy of illegal action of some kind. Um, the second is what they call fighting words. This means uh, speech which uh, would cause people right there and then at that moment to um, commit acts of violence. You might think that the fighting words provision could be included under the advocacy of uh, illegal actions, but there is a reason why they distinguish the two. And the two remaining cases are commercial speech, that is, there cannot be a, an unbridled freedom of expression for um, advertisers, let us say, to make great claims about their products, which are not borne out or which uh, haven't been tested, uh, and which, uh, in fact, there needs to be some prior restraint on what people can say in advertisements. And finally, obscenity. Well, of course, one person's obscenity is somebody else's uh, screen kiss. 
And so that is a very contested area too. And what the last two cases, commercial speech and, uh, and the obscenity, are ones where the fur tends not to fly much in debates about them, but where discussion is still needed. The first two cases, and let's take them together, the advocacy of illegal action. Well, what is so interesting about Supreme Court discussions, and there have been two major decisions by the Supreme Court in the last 100 years. One was uh, very soon after the First World War, and the other was in 1969, which is a significant date from the point of view of this discussion, of course, because that was at the height of the civil rights movement in the United States of America. In the first decision, in the early part of the century, the United States Supreme Court thought that any speech which generated, which, which threatened to cause what it described, and it's a phrase that has become famous, a clear and present danger to the security of the state or, or of the society, that, that that kind of speech is not protected by the First Amendment. Much later on, 1969, at the very height of the civil rights movement, the Supreme Court again looked at uh, the extent to which um, uh, expression was protected. And it said that any speech which was likely to cause imminent danger to security or safety, or which was uh, uttered in circumstances where it was likely to cause some kind of breach of, of uh, what was legal or acceptable in society, that that kind of speech was not protected. And I find it fascinating that the two words imminent and likely occur in those clauses. Because if somebody stood up in the United States of America today and um, suggested that uh, at some future date a, a, uh, an illegal action should be taken or there should be an illegal march, let us say, that speech would be protected because it doesn't propose anything imminent. If somebody stood up uh, in a, a, a kind of speaker's corner situation uh, somewhere in the United States and harangued a crowd in the hope of trying to get that crowd to do something illegal, and the crowd wasn't in the slightest bit moved to follow the speaker's in, uh, adjurations, that is, the crowd is not likely, then the speech uttered by that demagogue uh, would again be protected speech. So this uh, the idea of the imminence of the threat and of the likelihood of uh, any kind of speech having a threatening effect are extremely interesting controls uh, to, to place on the First Amendment right. They have the, the same character. Anybody in this room who is a, a British civil servant will recognize the great significance of this remark uh, of putting into statute in this country the word normally. So the minister will normally do such and such and so on and so on. This, of course, gives complete discretion to anybody to do what they like. And in effect, the normally provision is tucked away behind the idea of imminence and likelihood in the United States because those two phrases are very powerful protections of that First Amendment right to freedom of expression. Now, if that kind of attitude towards freedom of expression were generalized around our world, because in effect, of course, what they offer is a kind of carte blanche to the point that we just heard quoted from John Stuart Mill. The, the uh, carte blanche for people to challenge, to criticize, to propose, to put forward ideas, to test them, to discuss them, to debate them. If that were the case everywhere, uh, very, very large swathes of common sense might follow in our world. But alas, of course, freedom of expression is regarded as extremely threatening. You don't have to go just to North Korea or to today's China or to Iran uh, to see examples of places where um, authority organizations are afraid of what people might say, afraid of the questions that might be asked or the points of view that might be put. Alas, almost everywhere in our world, some form of limitation of freedom of expression occurs. The worst, the most corrosive, and the most insidious form of such limitation is self-censorship in the face of people who say they are offended by what you say, or who imply or indeed explicitly threaten violence in response to something that you say, some disagreement or challenge that you issue. So everywhere in the world, we don't have the situation that uh, John Stuart Mill um, said is necessary for the advancement of truth. We don't even have the situation, perhaps even in the United States of America, where a constitutional defense of free speech under what is a very liberal interpretation of that First Amendment in the 1969 uh, decision uh, exists. We might look a little bit closer at home to see under what other circumstances freedom of expression is curtailed by statute, by law in this country. 
a hate speech, as it's described. So this is the kind of speech which is, uh, um, might, might be used in a discriminatory and uh, um, hostile way towards uh, people who are disabled, uh, towards people on the basis of their age, towards people on the basis of their sex, and of their sexuality. There is a fifth uh, kind of speech which is not uh, protected by common law or by any other provision, and that is what's described as hate, hate speech against religion. Now, I'd like to offer to you the idea that whereas the first four areas of speech are ones where there should be limitations on what we can say and when we can say it, I don't think that this protection should be extended to religion. If you think about it, the first four, your disability, if you have one, your uh, uh, age, and we all have an age, uh, your sexuality, are not matters of choice. Your sex, nowadays, with advances in surgery and pharmacology, uh, is to some extent a matter of choice, but it's, people would be rather hard put to want to switch from being a woman to a man to escape uh, sex discrimination in our society. For example, that seems to be taking matters a bit too far. So we, we need to regard uh, one's uh, sex, or people now call it gender, as being part of uh, that, that family of states where people don't have a choice. You don't have a choice about how old you are. Alas, you don't have a choice uh, about your sexuality. Uh, you don't have a choice about uh, a disability if you have one. But you do have a choice about your political stance. You do have a choice about whether you believe there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. You do have a choice, even if it is sometimes an extremely difficult choice to make for social reasons, for community reasons, for personal psychological reasons, about your religion. Let's pause and think about that for a moment. The vast majority of people in the world, if they have a religious outlook, have the religious out outlook of their parents, of their community. We all know that the way that, uh, one of the principal ways that religions survive in our world uh, is by the inculcation of religious attitudes and beliefs in children. And for many people, and I'm thinking, for example, of uh, people who are members of Muslim communities, to lose a faith and to want to leave the religion is very difficult to do because it means being in breach of, of uh, one's relationships with family, with community. Uh, in certain circumstances, of course, in Muslim-majority countries, it can be dangerous to do it or to avow doing it. But, but even here in the United Kingdom, it's, it can be very tough indeed. And we have some, some rather brave and remarkable people who have uh, publicly um, announced that they are humanists or secularists, but who have paid a very large price for doing it. And this is where I think the, um, the difficulty that uh, attaches to making a choice about religion has prompted our legislatures to think to, that they should include religion in amongst those other things over which we have no choice. But that's not right. You may remember um, a year or two ago that um, the BHA ran a campaign here in which we put some babies up on the, uh, not actual babies, pictures of babies up on the side of, uh, of, uh, of big red London buses. <laughs> and, uh, and underneath each smiling face, we put a political party. You know, one little baby is a member of the Tory party, one another little baby, a Labour, another a Green, and so on. Which I remember that little baby looked rather green. And there was a, 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 an implication, of course, of this, which is that uh, nobody is born anything other than a human being. And I remember when my youngest daughter went to a little local school in central London where 36 different languages were spoken as first languages by the children in her kindergarten class. How the children played together and fought together and quarreled and, and cuddled and what have you without any sense whatever that the other children were anything other than other children. And it occurred to me then, and it's occurred to me with increasing uh, sense of tragedy really ever since, how hard we work in our world to create differences and divisions. How we have to teach our children uh, about color and about creed and about political outlook. How we introduce divisions in, in our world by these means. And this is something imposed. No baby is born a member of the Labour Party. No, no child is born a Roman Catholic. They're made these things by the pre-existing states of affairs in our societies. And this is, this is a, a, an example of how we should never regard as protected speech religious claims. We should never regard as proscribed any criticism or challenge to religious claims. 
I think every person in this room would be perfectly prepared to accept the right of somebody to challenge us over our humanist outlook, to ask for an explanation, to uh, have our views tested, to be asked what we think about the good that religions do in our world, because, uh, surprise, surprise, occasionally that happens. We need to be able to have a, a, a clear-minded, well-organized response to these sorts of challenges because we accept the right of other people to make those challenges. But that is a right that we uh, arrogate to ourselves as a really important central plank to what we do in our practice as, uh, as humanists with our kind of outlook. So the protection, again, the, 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 the lack of protection for um, uh, expression which constitutes hate speech in the categories that I've mentioned, disability, sex, age, and so on, uh, I think I agree with them. And I think I also agree that there might be very inflammable circumstances in a, in a society, in a world, where for a specific reason and for a limited amount of time, uh, we might be asked, to reserve our opinions for a while. But any blanket censorship of expression is inimical to human flourishing overall and to the possibility of good and progressive societies. Now, I go back to what I said right at the outset about the central importance of freedom of expression to the very possibility of possessing rights and of having a healthy and flourishing social order. That when people can't express their views and challenge other people's views. Maybe people can't explore alternatives and different ways in which we might live our lives as individuals and construct our societies. The result is going to be stultification. It's going to be loss of a huge amount of human potential and possibility. I think, for example, of the situation in today's Middle East where only 47% of women can read and write. And I think what that means in the way of loss of human potential, of what happens when uh, illiterate mothers are um, looking after their small children, having little um, access perhaps to news about the, the wider world and certainly very little opportunity to read to their children or, or to discuss ideas with their children that they might uh, not have come across before. And there you see the idea that the limitations imposed by the lack of freedom to have access to other people's speech is a very consequential matter in our world. So it seems to me it's not just a matter of uh, defending our outlook and having an instrument available to us, the instrument of, of speech, of challenge, of exploration and inquiry, by means of which we can challenge the believers in witchcraft in Africa. We can challenge the adoption of, of faith-based schooling in advanced economies, that we can uh, argue against the repressions and uh, disabilities imposed on women by um, many of the major religions. It's not just a question of defense and attack, it's a question of whole societies being able to take advantage of this wonderful thing that human beings have, uh, even though you may sometimes um, think they don't have it, and that is intelligence. Freedom of expression is the route by which human intelligence can seek the best and do the best in our world. Thank you very much. <laughs>